This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. This is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. Oh, sorry. This is Santa Claus for the Magic Word Podcast.com. Well, we're having a little bit of fun this year, getting ready for Christmas. We're still a little ways away, but now is the time to start thinking about some Christmas gift giving. And Santa has three great ideas for you for your chew and your children, particularly your children and grandchildren. Three books we're going to be talking about today. To begin with, we're going to talk with Amy Kimlet about her new book, which is called Hocus Pocus Practice Focus an excellent book, which I heartily heartily recommend that would be great for you and your child. And she gives a lot of great information about this and why it is will be such a good book to be underneath the Christmas tree for your child. The second one is one we had covered a while back, and that is with Alan Kronzik, and his book is called Grandpa Magic. So if you are an older person, you have grandchildren, this is a perfect book for you because this will teach you how to do some magic that you can entertain your grandchildren with these tricks that are easily within anyone's ability to grasp and understand. Because as a grandparent, and if you were a magician, a lot of times you're asked to about doing some magic tricks and grandpa magic will teach you exactly what you need to know. And then finally, we're going to talk with Murray Sawchuk uh, about his new book, At Nighttime, We Are All the Same Size. Now, this is a book that's not about magic in any way other than the magic of where you can understand what animals perhaps are thinking. <laughs> For the What I mean is by that, that as he explains, whenever that you lay down at night and you are on the same eye level as your pet animal, then you're all the same size. And so this perhaps might be something that's going on in the minds of your animal. So if you are an animal lover, if you if or if you rescue animals or you are part of that organization or have a rescue animal yourself or are thinking about getting a dog or a cat or you'd like to visit the zoo this is something that is a fun children's book that is great for you to get for your children then as well and to read them at night each of these books are probably i should say the first and the second book are for those between three to eight years old the other one grandpa magic is for more for the adults so I think you're going to enjoy these uh, three book selections and recommendations here for this Christmas. And now's the time that you can go and order any or all three of those through Amazon.com. And when you're doing that, be sure to use the Amazon link that's on the bottom of MagicWordPodcast.com. And there, when you click on that, we get a little bit of love back from Amazon for every dollar that you spend. So thank you very much. During this holiday season, it makes us all happy. So let's begin, first of all, with Amy Kimlat, Hocus Pocus, Practice Focus, here on The Magic Word. I have with me right now an author who is actually down in uh, Florida, and this is uh, her first time actually writing a book, and this is uh, an amazing book, and it has been heralded by such greats as David Copperfield and Penn among other uh, magicians, uh, including her husband, Kostya Kimlet. Perhaps you may have heard of him then as well. So this, she's a first-time author, and I'm excited because this is something that she's bringing not just, not really to the magic community so much as it is uh, to the general public in particular. And also the uh, the graphics and everything were phenomenal. And so I want to talk with her about uh, getting to know uh, about how she had developed this book and the concept behind it and all of that kind of thing. So Without me going on, I'll just ask the questions directly. Please welcome my guest, Amy Kimlat. Hey there, Amy. How are you? Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing great. Good. I'm glad to hear that. And I'm sure you are because, uh, boy, this book, it sounds like is just, uh, hopefully will just do uh, great business and, and do have great sales because this is something I have not, it's, there's just a void for this book. There, there hasn't been anything else out like this that I've seen before. Thank you. Yeah, it's There are many books out there for teaching children how to do magic tricks, but there aren't a lot of books out there that teach what really goes into being a magician. Things like hard work and study and persistence and mentorship. 
Good point. And I overlooked, I forgot to, to mention, of course, the title of the book is Hocus Pocus, Practice Focus. And I think the lessons to be learned are not just well towards the end where you do teach a couple of tricks. That's not what this book is about at all. It is really aimed more for what age group uh, child would you say five to eight years old, maybe? Or Yeah, I would say ages three to eight would probably be be the ideal range. Okay, because it, they have some marvelous illustrations. They also have uh, 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 the, the rhyming and everything. And I assume that you wrote it and then you have another friend who had illustrated this or tell me something about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I wrote the book and then I um, was on the hunt for an illustrator. Initially, I had planned to illustrate it myself and I actually completed a full draft where I had done my own illustrations. But once I had it finished, I really felt like I had something special in here that could be a transformative book for people. So I began looking for a professional illustrator to really take the book to the next level. So I found Srinidhi Srinivasan. She lives in India and she is incredibly talented. Um, and I'm very lucky to have been able to work with her. We worked very closely going back and forth with drafts and feedback for months. It looked like she was able to understand the direction you wanted to go with her. I assume you had a lot of back and forth and discussions as to the vision of how you wanted this book to look and feel. And yeah. it, it, it seems very much like it, you, it's accomplished that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I provided very specific instructions, which is a part of my personality. I had a spreadsheet with every page's text on uh, one for each row and then detailed instructions for what would appear on each page, what the characters should be wearing, what the settings should be, what their feelings should be. Um, and then, of course, I had to provide some very specific detailed instructions with regards to uh, magic specific things that were going to appear. So I had to provide her with some resources and videos of people performing different magic tricks. Have you always had an interest in wanting to write a children's book or have you had something else in mind? Have you at some point perhaps thought, well, I would like to have a, uh, I don't know, uh, a novel or something. I mean, have you got something else in mind or has it always been uh, children's books that have uh, interested you? I don't know if I ever uh, had a dream to have a children's book. I think I saw an opportunity that this children's book needed to exist. And so I wrote it. I have always had, uh, I have a creative background. I have a history with magic and a uh, history with writing and rhyming. So it does merge a lot of my talents and interests, but I would not say that I had always set out to write a children's book. Um, more so I wanted to accomplish something with this book. And so I wrote it to get the message out. And so your first muse, if you will, I guess, could it, you talk about magic, how you've always had kind of an interest in magic. It was that something that you were just kind of scratching out on a, on a napkin in a coffee shop one time and one or thinking about, well, this rhymes with this or whatever, or. Uh, Kostya and I were in Nashville and he had just done a magic show. We were in the hotel room afterwards and it was very late. He had already fallen asleep. And in the way that creativity can just strike like lightning, I had this idea of a book and it all just kind of came together in a night where I knew that I wanted to have a young magician who was a girl, where the fact that she was a girl was not a plot point. She just happened to be a girl to normalize seeing that. And I knew that I wanted her to be inspired by a professional magician who was also a woman. And I wanted that magician to mentor her because I think a lot of kids, um, are unaware of what goes into becoming a successful magician. And so I really wanted to show kids, this is what it takes, uh, girls and boys. It, it takes a lot of hard work, practice, focus, study. You need books, you need a mentor, you need the ability to accept feedback. Um, in the book, you'll see that Mila, the main character, she doesn't just jump right in and successfully perform a magic show. She has a lot of failures along the way, and once she begins taking it seriously, she doesn't actually perform a magic show for a full year. And so I think a lot of kids have a tendency, and probably adults too, to learn a trick and immediately perform it. Look what I can do. And so I really wanted to show kids that there's value in putting in the practice and the time and waiting until you have perfected it or not perfected it, but gotten it to a point of presentation. I think one of the uh, key factors there also that you had uh, just almost glossed over and that is the importance of 
persistence and 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 failure and not being afraid to fail but continuing on with practice in order to uh, to to make it right in other words you get discouraged so easily particularly at and when you're young and you're running into different directions it's like oh well that didn't work out i'm going to go do this well i'm not so good at doing that so i'm going to do this so you try so many things whenever that you're young and uh, and, and this is just something that is encouraging children not just girls uh, but boys as well to um to do their best and to practice and the importance of uh not to worry about failure right i it's definitely something that i did not realize when i was a child i definitely leaned towards the towards more the uh, perfectionism side of things and so all of the things that i was good at i think I believed I was good at because I was naturally talented at these things. And sure, natural talent can play a role, but I was probably not good at drawing because I was naturally good at drawing. I think I was good at drawing because I had drawn so much. And people and children especially don't view magic in the same way. They um, Kids may think that they need to have powers or um, things should just come naturally to them to them because it looks so easy when professionals do it. And so I certainly didn't realize when I was a kid magician how much practice and how much failure was required in order to continue and persist at it. And as a matter of fact, when I was in the eighth grade, I did a magic show for my eighth grade class and I did a cups and balls routine. And one of the balls that was supposed to be hidden rolled right out of the cup and across the table. <laughs> and I was mortified and I thought this was the worst thing ever. And after that magic show, I thought, okay, well, I guess magic's just not for me because I didn't have any magician mentor. I didn't know any magicians in real life. No one told me that that's just part of it and that the most professional, successful magicians in the world have failures in their careers, even once they are making a career out of it. That might be something that what you're talking about there, they can encourage other writers perhaps to talk about other other things, for example, science, uh, talking about scientists and how that they had failed or um, inventors or whatever, not to get discouraged, but to continue to to work. Uh, and so I can see how this is not only encouraging just for children to become a magician, but again, moreover, more importantly, is to not be discouraged and to continue, to continue practicing just because you failed once doesn't mean you're going to continue to, you're going to actually learn from those failures. Absolutely. And I've noticed it even in, we have two daughters. Uh, we have a three-year-old Estelle and a two-year-old Adelaide. And after we read the book to them, I noticed a really clear difference with Estelle and how she perceived practice and the value of practice, even at the age of three. Kostya had taught her a very simple hairband jumping trick, which she was very excited about. And she was trying it out one morning in her car seat when we were on the way to school. And then when we parked, she wanted to show it to me. And so she went to show it to me and it was just not working on her tiny little fingers. And instead of getting frustrated as most three-year-olds would, she said, that's okay, mommy, I'll practice later. <laughs> and so I think this message is just so important and valuable to kids from very young ages, like a three-year-old. And this value of practice I've seen, she has she's embraced this value of practice even in other areas of her life. So um, I do think it's a very valuable message to, to kids, regardless of what their interests are. I think it's also great the fact you started out as a magician then yourself uh, and had, had carried on. I assume that that's how you and Kosia had met because of similar interests? That's a great question. We actually met through um, fairly regular means, I guess you could say, as, as regular as it can be when you're a magician. <laughs> uh, we met, I lived, I grew up in Baltimore and he lived in Orlando and we met um, because he was performing a magic show at my workplace. He jokes that he volunteered to do this magic show. It was a nonprofit. He volunteered to do this magic show as an excuse to meet me. So um, <laughs> that is how we actually met in person. But what's crazy is that on our first date, I was telling him how I was so into magic when I was a child, which of course he was surprised to hear. And I was so into magic that I used to post on these online magic forums and I brought up alt.magic. Are you familiar with alt.magic? I'm magic? very familiar. So, so what, this is exactly what happened after, after our first date, I went back home and I did a search for all of my old posts and I'm reading them one by one. And I find this one post from January 1st, 1998. And I was 13 years old living in Baltimore and I asked a question and then I looked down and on January 2nd, 1998, I got an answer from a 14 year old in Orlando and it was Kostya. Wow. And so Kostya actually answered my question on alt.magic and I had no idea for 15 years. And then um, 
What's really amazing is that I asked the question on January 1st and he answered it on January 2nd. And mm -hmm. then on January 3rd, 18 years later is when we got married. Wow. <laughs> what a great story. Wild, right? It is wild. Yes. I recall uh, alt.magic and that was kind of the original forum, I guess, back when you could ask questions and you kind of wait and then you do dial up again, see if you get right. <laughs> <laughs> have that right. long beep and wait until somebody answered uh, and then uh, type in your message and then whatever. And and so it was fun to kind of chat with people old and new and young and old. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. All different uh, aspects of uh, magic and interest in magic and alt magic. That was, uh, those were different days. Those were the beginning, I guess, of what later became the magic cafe probably <laughs> yes very different days the days without notifications uh that's true yep yep you yeah. would just have to go out and check from time to time and it was so anxious i mean like i'm sure with you you'd ask a question you were thinking i hope someone answers this question and sure enough he did it the very next day so that's pretty cool yeah wild yeah. <laughs> it is. Now, as far as publishing this, I'm interested as well about, is this self-published? Did you find a publisher? Did you go out and uh, uh, actively solicit somebody once that you had this idea? I mean, there is a lot to, going on with trying to get a book finally published and out there, as opposed to if you want to do your own self-publication, there are different uh, ways, of course, that you could do that. But then the marketing is all up to you, as opposed to having a, a major, let's say, Penguin publisher or somebody. I mean, there are different uh, publishing houses. So did you go through a house or is it self-published or tell me something about that? Sure. Initially, I thought I wanted a traditional publisher. And this was four years ago when I wrote my first draft. And I had really shelved the project for three years. Uh, shortly after I wrote the first draft, I was pregnant and then life just got in the way. I had, you know, we have two kids. Um, we had two children under two. So um, I was very busy. So it wasn't until the beginning of this year that I picked the book up again. And I very quickly realized that I needed to publish this book myself for several reasons. Um, when you publish a book yourself, you're really in control of the full process. Mm -hmm. And when you have a publisher, obviously they they own the rights, they're in charge of it all, they decide how long it's going to take. So it takes many years for a book to see market. Whereas this book, I really picked it up back up in January and by October, I'm publishing it. So I could never have done a fast track timeline and getting the whole thing done in 10 months and out if I was going through a traditional publisher. And I really like the idea of being in control of, of selecting the illustrator and directing the art um, and managing the entire process and retaining control and ownership of everything as well. And these days, the way the the difference in uh, the differences in what traditional publishers are able to offer you as far as marketing is not terribly different from self publishing because mm -hmm. traditional publishers really expect you to do the majority of your own marketing these days. They literary agents are looking for authors with platforms, and publishers are looking for the same thing. So I thought, well. My background is in marketing and PR. That is my career. And so if I'm going to be expected to market my own book, even if I go to a traditional publisher, why not just keep the rights and do it myself on my own timeline? And so that's exactly what I've done. Yeah, then I don't see really what the advantage is of going to a traditional publisher, since they're essentially saying the same thing. We're going to use your platform. You market it. I mean, what, what do they bring to the table then? I do think traditional publishers have access. Um, they have access to distribution beyond what self-publishers typically have, at least from the beginning. So there are certainly advantages and there are definitely advantages if you are intimidated by the marketing aspect of it, but because mm. that's something that excites me and, and something I have looked forward to doing, it was really a no-brainer and I would just figure out the rest of the publishing process. Right. Wow. Uh, very inspirational. I mean, there are a lot of other people who might have had some ideas for writing books, but might have been hesitant. And it sounds like it's quite encouraging what you're suggesting there. If, uh, if you've got an idea, then go for it. Definitely. At every step of the way of the publishing process, I have learned just how much more there is to it. Mm -hmm. And there's just something else that I need to do. And so this has been a tremendous learning process, um, but it's certainly doable. Well, hopefully the sales will get the attention perhaps of uh, some major publisher and who might say, Amy, we'd like for you to do a book for us. Could be. You never know. <laughs> you never know. Well, this sounds like it's uh, just got success written all over it. And as we're going into the holiday season, I'm sure this is uh, one that should be on the top of the list for parents to buy for their children. And this is something that the children can easily read themselves uh, and or the parent could read with them, depending upon their age. Absolutely. And I really designed the book to be something that parents would enjoy reading because it is a rhyming book. And as a parent, I tend to gravitate to the books that rhyme and, and the books that rhyme well. 
because it's not easy to make a book rhyme well and have strong meter. And sometimes when I have a picture book that I have to read to my child and it doesn't have rhyme and it's got a lot of words, it can just be a slog to get through books, especially if they're not well-written. And so I'm hoping that by making it rhyme and having the illustrations being really colorful and having some fun surprises in there as well, parents will enjoy actually reading these books to their, this book to their children. Speaking of rhyming, there is one particular rhyme that uh, sticks out to me in the book. And I think, you know what I'm talking about? What it, yeah. It uh, magicians work hard, just like dancers and singers. They don't become great just by snapping their fingers. It, and that's pretty much the bottom line. I think in that summarizes the book so well, because it is something in which the, the child sees this and thinks, oh, that's all you have to do. Uh, for an example, I remember uh, um, Oscar Munoz was watching a magician when he was a child and this guy did the miser's dream and he thought that's what i want to do i want to be able to pull money out of the air for free and and make money mm -hmm. it doesn't quite work like that you just can't say hocus pocus and it takes a lot right. of practice and that's essentially what uh is the, is the bottom line of what your book is is saying is not that there's real not really magic like that but it does take a little bit of time and uh practice Absolutely. Yeah. Kids definitely have a tendency to get a magic kid and then dive right in, figure a trick out and perform it immediately. And so I want kids to take a pause and practice that trick over and over and over again. <laughs> and that's something that I really emphasize in the book that you see Mila, she practices one trick over and over and over again, instead of jumping from trick to trick to trick. And then she just really does a deep dive into, into her rehearsal and her practice before she presents her show to anybody. Well, when you say that, uh, I think it's also something that all magicians should take to heart, certainly. And that is you just don't buy a trick tonight or today and put it in your show tonight because some people do. Or it's like right. they see it and by the time they order it and receive it, when they buy it online, then they put it in their show immediately without any rehearsal or practice or anything then at all. So even though this is written for children, perhaps the uh, message that you're trying to say to us, I say is to us, magicians in general, not just to children. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I do think adults have a thing or two to learn from Hocus Pocus, Practice Focus. <laughs> and that's the title again, Hocus Pocus, Practice Focus. Amy, thank you very much. Where can people find this book? And so since you are marketing this yourself, where can people find it? Absolutely. They can find it on Amazon. They can search Hocus Pocus, Practice Focus. Or you can visit my website, which is amykimlat.com. That's A-M-Y, not a right? A -M, Correct. A-M-Y-K-I-M-L-A-T.com. There we go. And I wish you great luck with this. I know it's going to be a great seller and it's uh, something that should be on the Christmas list and in the Christmas stocking for your children. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for being with us today. That was Amy Kimlat for Hocus Pocus Practice Focus. This is Scotty out. And now let's welcome Alan Kronzik as he talks about grandpa magic. With me right now is an author from New York who has created a children's book that I think deserves your attention. Uh, and I say, I should say, deserves your attention again, as this was written back in uh, 2018. And uh, it's something that uh, if you haven't got a copy, you should. Or if you overlooked this first time, now's your time to catch up. Uh, so he, it, it is a very good book and it's sold very well, but uh, again, deserves your attention. So let me introduce the author then right now, my friend, Alan Kronzik. Hey there, Alan, how are you? I'm good. Good afternoon. It's good to see you. And also, I wanted to talk about uh, your children's book uh, to begin with. I, this was. I, I want to um, sort of correct you. It's yes. a children's book by default. The target audience was grandparents. Oh, completely that's, different. You're right. That's the original target audience. Um, but it turns out that because the book is so uh, well illustrated and easy to understand, um, eight plus can learn all the stuff in it. And so many kids end up reading the book, but the original target was grandparents. Is this a book that was intended then for grandparents to buy for their grandchildren or nope. for- No, it was intended for grandparents to connect with their children, uh -huh. to get them off their phones, to <laughs> find a way to interact with them. Um, it really came about because um, when people saw me do some stuff, some magic, um, often somebody would come up to me afterwards and say, hey, can you teach me a trick I can show the grandkids? And um, that happened a lot. And when I was looking around for a new project, my wife said, hey, you know, all those people who say, Alan, you know, show me something I can do for the grandkids. There's a book there. And 
And I thought, well, in fact, there is a book there. And really, that's how the book came about. So it's just a, how to connect with the grandchildren, pretty much regardless of age, like from, from toddler to teen. And so this is written for the adult, but in a children's kind of a way. So, I mean, it's something that the child can read along with you. Um, that's not the intention. Um, you know, because the, the magic section is just, you know, it's instructional. It has scripts too, but it's instructional and it's really um, beautifully illustrated. So it's easy to learn the material. And uh, so the target audience was grandparents. You learn it when you're out in a restaurant and they're sitting around the table and, and the kids are staring at their phones. You can do something. You can do something with the, the utensils at hand, with the napkins, with the straws, what, you know, to do table magic. But you can also um, pull out a, a bunch of pocket change and do some coin stuff or coin puzzles or toothpick puzzles or riddles. So the whole idea is uh, interact interact and connect with the kids. And then if they become fascinated by what you're doing and want to know how they can do it, that's when you start to teach. And then that's when you can share the material in the book, actually in the book. That's interesting because it's, again, not directed necessarily at children, but again, as you say, towards grandparents. And in particular, the children that you are showing the tricks to as a grandparent could be of any age that you want, whether it's going to be three to 13 or whatever. So it's not really a children's book per se. Then I see exactly what you're saying. Uh, uh, correct. You know, the material is a wide variety of material. So there's, you know, for a toddler, you can take a napkin and turn it into a bunny, a really cuddly, lovable bunny or you can turn it into a chicken. And for a 13 year old or a 15 year old, you can do some really baffling card magic, for example, or a little coin magic. Right. As I recall, when we first talked about this and it came out a few years ago, uh, wasn't your daughter involved? Is she is an author as well, or correct me, it seems like that she uh, had- She was involved in, in one of my previous books. That we was did it. a guide to the Harry Potter books uh, called The Sorcerer's Companion, and we wrote that one together. And that one is in particular more for what, the uh, teen audience? Uh, it's really for anybody capable of reading the Harry Potter books. So if you can read a Harry Potter book, um, you will find this reader's guide illuminating. And the older you are, the more you will understand the more advanced material, like the history of magical beliefs and stuff. Uh, an eight or nine year old, you know, will, will, I'm not sure how absorbed they would be by that, but the real diehard Harry Potter fans of 11 or 12, they just dove into this book because it has all of the uh, backgrounds of the, where the material that's taught at Hogwarts, where does it come from? You know, it really comes from Persia and Egypt and ancient Greece and Rome, all those rituals and spells and, you know, potions, all that lore um, that J.K. Rowling used as, you know, real historical belief um, and practice. And wasn't there a second book or a follow-up to that or something that you were working on? There were uh, three additions to that book. So when the book first came out, there were four Harry Potter books and no movies. We were rushing to get the book out to uh, coincide with the first Harry Potter movie, which came out at Christmas. So that was the goal. What year was that? Uh, 2011. And the launch date was September and we had tours lined up and bookstores and readings and we're all set to go. And then what happens? 9-11. Oh, 2001, not 2011. Yeah, I'm sorry, 2001. Right. right. And then 9-11 happens and everything is canceled. Mm, you know? Wow. And, and then it was, oh, holy smokes, all the plans, all the marketing, all the coming out. But it bounced back, fortunately. Right. That, that, you know, that's... So anyway, there were there were four books and one movie. And then after two more books, we updated to include material in those books. And then after all the books were published, we updated once again. And that's available also uh, at Amazon.com. Sure. And again, Companion. what's that called again? What's the book? Sorcerer's Companion. Okay. And so when you said it's updated, so this is the third edition, so you don't need the first and second edition. This is the updated stuff with all the new exactly. material added each, on. Each book up thicker and thicker. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, going back then to uh, Grandpa Magic, uh, I wanted to find out about uh, the how you found a 
person to illustrate that? And uh, obviously you or your daughter didn't do that. How'd you go about finding someone to do that for you? I did not find someone. The publisher did. Oh. You know, the publisher is um, responsible for the fact that it's a really, really good looking book. Uh, ta -da. And it's really beautifully illustrated. I don't know. You know, I'm not going to. Is that the same publisher that did Magic for Dummies? Uh, no, but it's the same publisher uh, Josh J has for his kids book. So here's like what the illustrations look like. It's Workman and Workman Publishing um, has always been noted for uh, beautifully illustrated books and um, great marketing and uh, a lot of um, how to books, you know, cooking. And so they're, they're a niche publisher. But this was the perfect niche. And so I wanted them as a publisher. And I went to them um, with this idea. And we went back and forth a few times. And I went in and met them at their offices and did some magic. And uh, eventually they said, it's a go. And I didn't really have a clear vision of what it was supposed to look like in the end. I thought it would be illustrated with photographs, photographs of me, photographs of hands, um, explaining how to do the trick. And the original title was uh, Amazing Grandparents, plural. So we started doing the book and they started taking the pictures. And along the way, as we're almost, I mean, they started taking the pictures. We had three um, long all day photo sessions uh, going over each trick um, with a, they brought in the freelance photographer. And um, there's also a, a production designer who was there, you know, setting me up and just setting up the poses and uh, in some shots, just wanting to make sure my sleeves were right. And then there was me saying, but you need a shot of this. You need a shot of this. You need a close up of this because they didn't really know how to illustrate a magic book. You know, you need point of view shots for the, performer's point of view as well as the audience and what's hidden. So we had to um, go through that process and later I needed even more. So a photographer friend out here uh, produced some more photos and they in turn uh, were sent to an illustrator who used the photos to illustrate the book. And it was only late in the process that I discovered, well, the book is called Grandpa Magic and by the way, you're a cartoon figure, you know? So they took all the <laughs> photographs and turned them into a comic book uh, of sorts, a comic book impression, which is what makes it look like a kid's book. It looks like a kid's book. And Grandpa Magic on the cover looks like I'm entertaining the grandkids or, you know, I'm the, I'm the magic guy and I'm gonna introduce them to magic or whatever. This was all the publisher's idea uh, and their, their packaging, and it was a great idea. Uh, but it, it came as a shock to me, I must say, to find out that I was now a cartoon character and, you know, people identified me as, oh, that's that's Grandpa Magic. You know, when I went to do book readings, oh, look, here he is. He's Grandpa Magic. <laughs> so I became Grandpa Magic. That's great. It's great to have that kind of notoriety and recognition then as well, even from a cartoon figure that that so closely resembles you. It's like, that's the guy <laughs> right there. That's yeah. <laughs> Now, when you had selected that publisher, I assume that's not the same one who did the Harry Potter book for you. It's a different publisher that did that. Different publisher. The Harry Potter was Broadway Books, which was Random House. Okay. So, random, you know, and they, um, this was the, there, there, there were two Harry Potter guidebooks that came out at the same time. Two of us had the idea. I forget the other guy's name, but he was a complete jerk. He took my title <laughs> The Sorcerer's Companion wow. and took that website wow. uh, before I could. But anyway, this book, my book was much better. And um, so that was Random House and a great marketing uh, blitz, except for 9-11, beautiful posters, all kinds of materials for the stores. And so they did great. Um, and I approached them with the grandpa um, idea and they weren't so hot about it. So they deserve first chance. That's the deal anyway. When somebody publishes your book, sometimes they get the mm -hmm. option to take your next book. They said, no, thank you. And then I went to Workman 
And I did a little research online, looking at their editors and which editors had edited what books. And I figured, I think Kylie is the editor for me. So um, I emailed her and uh, I had a good opening. Hi, let me introduce myself. I'm the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Sorcerer's Companion, and I have a great idea. And then I pitched the book. Was that your intent from the very beginning, or did you think ever in the initial about your first book, again, with your daughter, the uh, about the Harry Potter book, of self-publication? Um, no, never. I mean, uh, we certainly thought of it for a few seconds. <laughs> but when you have a really a good idea and a hot idea, you get an advance. So well, I got paid to write this. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when we went to Random House, I had a, a terrific agent before Random House um, who knew exactly what to do. And she put the book up for auction, uh, which you normally don't do, but you send the manuscript, the idea, the idea being the pitch is introduction to the book and maybe four or five chapters. That's what your, that's the basic pitch. Mm -hmm. And this is what the book is going to be. And she sent it out to like five or six major publishers and everybody bid on it. And Random House um, bid the highest by far. And um, we almost fell off our chairs um, when they made the offer. And um, we said, yeah. So that money was split between my daughter and I, and it gave us the time not to have to worry about, you know, money while we were writing the book because I was doing school shows and things like that. And then I had to cut all that out and just sit at my desk because they were in a great hurry to get the book out before Christmas. Right. So you put all your shows and everything on hold and thought, yeah. OK, I'm, I've got a check right here that will cover all that because I need to focus just on this and then I'll do other stuff later. Yeah, you get a third in front, a third on delivery, and a third on publication. Okay. And then I'm sure there are all kinds of deals, uh, some of which might include royalties on the back end or anything. That was not oh, part yeah. of it. No, sure. Both of them have royalties. Okay. And, so and with the Sorcerer's Companion, I got, uh, we got, we got like 16 foreign editions. So wow. that provided a lot of money. And then for years, we got royalties, particularly from the American edition and the Spanish edition, which sold great. Hmm. And uh, now we still get royalties, but only like four four $400 a year or something like that. But we still get something. And with Grandpa Magic, I uh, got a very nice advance and I have yet to receive a royalty. Uh, it'll probably be another year or two before I make up the advance. They have to recover the advance. And in this particular deal, they also, uh, needed to cover, uh, recover part of the high cost of illustration, the photography, and then there was a freelance illustrator doing, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of illustrations. So that cost a lot of money. And I had to allow them to uh, recoup on that before I start getting royalties. When you were talking about him, them taking all the photos of that and you were saying, well, a lot of this needs to be taken a lot more close up and some of the detail and everything. And it made more sense to illustrate that, certainly. And I know how much time it has to take Richard Kaufman whenever he illustrates all of his books then as well. And that's full of illustrations. But this is chock full of illustrations. And so, as you said, there were hundreds there. And so that had to take a lot of time and a lot of money, I would think, to pay yeah. the illustrator to uh, for all the time that they took to do that, because they're beautiful illustrations and make oh, perfect he's sense. A really good illustrator. His name is Kyle Hilton. And then he went on to, oh, who, who am I thinking of? Illustrate another magic book for a celebrity magician who was the uh, president of the castle for a while, actor. Neil Patrick Harris? Yes. Yeah. I think he did a kid's book, same illustrator. Yes, he did a children's book. That's right. I forgot. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay. And, uh, was yeah. his a magic book? Uh, yeah, in some sense. I don't remember it, but I, mm -hmm. I did look at it and it was a magic. It was a how-to. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, so this is something that, uh, again, you're eventually going to be getting some royalties off of uh, Grandpa Magic, <laughs> it sounds like, down the road. But uh, still, is something that is selling. And again, I am assuming available from Amazon.com, or is there a website people can go to as well? No, Amazon, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you know, Walmart, any Target, everybody has it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is your favorite trick out of the whole book? 
Um, or perhaps the one you show whenever that you're on tour and they say, show us a trick, Grandpa. Uh, jumping rubber bands. With uh, the fingers, you mean? The jumping rubber bands? Yeah. Okay. yeah. It, it's very um, personalized in that, you know, I just, wrong color, but <laughs> I introduce uh, this guy. Mm -hmm. And this is Ronnie the rubber band. And did you hear that the rubber band Olympics are coming up? Oh, yeah. Ronnie's going to be in the Olympics. He's in the jumping contest. So that's the premise. And then, mm -hmm. you know, show uh, Ronnie's going to jump from here to there. But before you do any exercise, um, like jumping, you should do some stretching. So Ronnie always does some stretching. And then I'll usually have the kid say, one, two, three, jump, Ronnie. And they say, one, two, three, jump, Ronnie. And then Ronnie jumps and he's on the top fingers. Anyway, personalizing um, the trick and making Ronnie a character. Um, if I'm showing this to a kid or even an adult, it's it's charming and it plays very well. So I like I like it's probably my favorite. Wow, that's great. Well, I wish you continued luck with that. And so my last question has to do with any future project. I mean, this has been something that you did. You said the Sorcerer's Companion was something that you had a, a short timeline to complete before the movie was coming out way back when. Then you had subsequent editions on this. And then when you did this uh, book, you've had success and done a tour with that. Do you, did you find that that was successful enough that you would like to do another book similar to that or by adding more tricks for Grandpa Magic? volume two or perhaps having something that's more directed at children um i do not have another children's book in mind okay the first i did write a children's book much much earlier my first book is called the secrets of alcazar and uh, for an eight or a nine or a ten year old who's really serious about learning magic it's a really good book um mm -hmm. doesn't have the great illustrations but it covers all manner of topics, the magic theory, presentation, um, you know, handling, all, all the aspects of magic in each chapter, um, Secrets of Alcazar. So that was my kid's book. If I had to write it again, I would do it differently, um, just in terms of targeting who it was for. But the content is, is I'm really proud of the content and proud of the book. Um, one of these days, uh, Conjuring Arts, uh, research center will bring out a book called the book of powers which i wrote years ago and um for a, a non-profit that the conjuring arts uh, had in progress at the time which is now on hold but will eventually come out again so we have that book but i'm not planning it oh there could be an update to grandpa magic uh, not yet it originally was one third bigger we cut a third out of it so mm. i already have a third of a sequel um so we may or may not uh, right now i'm really basically uh working on magic material i have a a wonderful uh weekly um gig at the uh at a bar connected to a wonderful nonprofit cinema and so i'm at the green room bar every tuesday night and developing new material and uh, just working on stuff and the green room bar you live in uh long island new york right I live on the east end of Long Island in a wonderful little town called Sag Harbor, an old whaling village. Mm -hmm. Very touristy in the summer, but um, great, a great place to live, great culturally. We've got, you know, a, a regional theater. We've got this triplex nonprofit cinema. We've got a, a nonprofit art center that's always busy. So a uh, good place to live. Sounds like a, a lot of fun and a place where the public can come and see Grandpa Magic. Yeah. as well. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Alan. Good luck. Uh, continued success with uh, the book then as well. And uh, I encourage people then to go and check that out at uh, amazon.com. And that is Grandpa Magic. And that is Grandpa Magician himself right there, Alan Kronzik. Thanks, Alan. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, it was great fun. Good talking to you. So for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Alan Kronzik. This is Scotty out. And now let's welcome Murray Sawchuk as he talks about his new book, At Nighttime, We Are All the Same Size. We're going out now to Las Vegas where we're speaking with um, uh, my good friend and uh, someone who is another author of a, I should say a recent author of a children's book and a first time author. We have spoken with someone already who was a first time author and we've got somebody else then now again who has written a children's book and it is a, a 
uh, not a magic book per se, but it is something written by a magician for children. And so I wanted to introduce my buddy over there from Las Vegas. Here he is, Murray the Magician, Murray Sawchuk. Hey, Murray. Hey, how you doing, buddy? And yes, I actually put a book together. Can you believe that? So there that was my uh, COVID project. So, <laughs> well, that was what I was going to ask you. What prompted you to uh, to write the book? And you, I guess you had the time, obviously, during COVID, during two years. Yeah, well, I'm not a writer, you know, but um, I, I love kids books like anybody. You know, I grew up on Dr. Seuss and um, those rabbit books and all that stuff. I think a lot of them grew up on Aunt Peter Rabbit or whatever it's called. And so... Yeah. A lot of people know that me and my wife are huge supporters of rescuing animals. And yes. overall, I've rescued about five long-haired chihuahuas over, you know, the course of my life. We have three long-haired chihuahuas now and a cat, and they're all rescues. And one dog is named Bailey, and she's big and fluffy, and, and you've met her before, and she's scared of everybody. So when me and my wife, Danny, were first dating, she would always never get close to Danny. And, um, but when she lied on the floor to watch TV or went to bed at night, all of a sudden she'd stop barking, run up and fall asleep right on the pillow by her head. Mm -hmm. And so I made this really interesting analogy that when you're lying down on the floor, Bailey, the little chihuahua who's about eight pounds, actually is taller than you at that moment because you're mm -hmm. lying down and the, the dog's above your head looking eye to eye at you. So I would say before I went to bed, I'd say, oh my God, at nighttime, we're all the same size because she had no relation to the length of her because you're lying down. Right. It was the height. So the puppy was actually taller than her and then not scared. So every night I'd say this funny saying, and I said, you know, one night I should write a book called at nighttime, we're all the same size. And so I did. And it's basically this book, you know, that has this um, relationship and the, the cover has me looking into the eyes of something you don't know. And then when you open it right up completely, it's actually a bear, which isn't even, you know, obviously <laughs> the same size as me. It's just a little fun thing with the cover. And, uh, and it's basically a metaphor on this. And I, now my thing is when I get with the idea for the book, I said, well, I got the title of it. And I got one page of it, but what's the rest <laughs> of the book? Right. And because I love animals and of course kids love animals, I decided to put the whole book uh, about animals. And this little character that kind of looks like me with the blonde hair and glasses and um, each scene um, shows a relationship to an animal, whether it be a mouse, a bird, a snake, you know, a giraffe, a bear, you know, and it's basically a metaphor of um, looking at people, not judging them on how they look or sound, but seeing them eye to eye. And that's how you can really understand someone. So it's a bit of a uh, early education of not judging people on, you know, not judging a book by the cover, ironically. I've learned that a long time ago. I when I used to work children's parties or even family shows that I might still do, it's I always make sure to kind of stoop down or kneel down so you're eye to eye at the same level of the child. I think that they can respect you a little bit better and understand when you're you're speaking to them like that. Yeah, it makes a big difference. Yeah, when you can when somebody talks to you like that, or even when you speak to somebody, you know, you've had people I'm sure talk down to you over the years just because naturally that's the way they. They right. know how to communicate or they just do. And it could be young, old and different. And there really is an art form to walking into a room and talking to somebody, not sounding like a know-it-all, but yet you are more educated, that person maybe, but not sharing it in that way, you know, necessarily, you know. Right. Now, as far as writing the book, and you said you had never had any experience in writing this, and you thought, well, this is, I've got the perfect title. Did the rest of this kind of roll off your brain fairly easily? I mean, did it kind of write itself as you started getting into it, or did you kind of toil over it? And how long was the process of actually writing this? And then is it, first of all, and then number two, is it prose? Is it a rhyming thing or a, just a, a book? It's, it's, it is a rhyming thing. It's got a pattern. So it's not rhyming per se, like cat the hat type stuff, but it's a repetition. So the first page, the first two pages, you open it up and you see, you know, you see something um, that's the relationship to the, the animal. So say it's a giraffe, you know, and basically the, the young boy sees a giraffe. Oh my goodness. You know, um, you're so, so tall. And the giraffe replies like, well, I'm a giraffe. You know, of course I'm, you know, you're so, so big and tall. Of course I'm a giraffe, I'm big and tall. And then the next page you open to and has a giraffe sleeping on the ground with the boy sleeping in his neck and looking eye to eye. But at nighttime, we're all the same size. And that's the reputation of both. You know, a bear, you're so big and fluffy. A mouse, you're so tiny and small, you know. A bird, you're so flighty and fragile. So it has this relationship to what they are, what we would judge them as. Mm -hmm. And then the relationship of the boy and that animal seeing eye to eye. 
And um, so again, as far as the writing of that, did that kind of flow once you had the title? It or did because it was just a repetition of sharing thoughts and ideas uh, of different things that looked different, meaning a bird, gotcha. a giraffe, a bear. And then it's just repetition over and over that it doesn't matter whether you're a bear or an ant or a mouse, we're all the same kind of thing just trying to exist so you can understand each other by looking eye to eye so that's that's that was where i came up with it because i didn't know where <clears throat> to go with it but that was my whole idea of it so i just used animals as a metaphor as in humans black white chinese asian vietnamese you know you speak whatever language, down right. syndrome whatever it might be you know mm -hmm. um that at the end of the day once you get past the outside look we're people that are just trying to survive and enjoy life, you know, or a car, four wheels and a windshield, doesn't matter what kind it is, that's kind of what it is. <laughs> Maybe sometimes three wheels, you know, but. Exactly. Now, again, you had uh, written the book, but you found someone else obviously to illustrate that. And how did you go about finding your illustrator? Yeah, I, I, you know, I reached out to a couple people when I first wrote, I had one illustrator. We tried stuff for four months and it just wasn't going anywhere. You know, I, you know, if you know anything about me, when I say something, I want it done, you know, whether, and usually it's me doing it and, and, you know, getting things done. I just don't have a lot of time to sit around for people. So the guy, the first guy I was using just didn't work out. Good artist. I just did not produce quick enough. Although you are in to... landscaping, certainly no grass grows under your feet. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Tell me about it. Tell me about it. So, yeah. So I, so that lasted four months and I had them in that relationship and I went looking again, I took a break, you know, and then I talked to an agent of mine and said, I got a great illustrator. He does t-shirts and he does, you know, he writes Hallmark cards and stuff like that. And his name's William Watts out of Oregon. And I said, great, let me see his stuff. And when I saw his stuff, he sent me four or five different styles because that's what artists do, you know, when they can do different styles. And I saw one that was exactly the way I wanted it perceived. You know, for me as a person growing up and at my age now, I was a visual learner, not a words learner, you know, meaning, you know, like the Mark Wilson's Course in Magic was the book I used to learn, not Bobo's Coin Book. You know, I read Bobo's Coin Book, uh, but I found it very boring and only a couple of illustrations. So when you're taking a coin and putting it here, I just could not figure it out. Whereas Marx Wilson's Course of Magic, if anyone are familiar with these two books, every paragraph is an illustration. And I actually use the illustrations more than the descriptions because that's how I learn by visuals. So therefore, it was very important for this book to be very visually stimulating. Just even as kids, if you know, young kids who don't even know how to read yet, they can still look at the pictures and enjoy the book, you know, and um, because that's the way I was, you know, I mean, the story's there, but the visuals is really what I look at. And that goes in my life, even as a performer on stage, my magic is much more visual than intellect. A lot of it, you know what I mean? Because that's mm -hmm. the way I like things, you know, same with landscaping. When you walk into a backyard, I want things that stand out in our company because that's the way I, I look at things, you know. So with this book, it was all about the visuals and, and looking, you know, at what it might be. And also there's a little secret in the book as well that I really haven't shared with anybody. Um, but it repeats on every two pages you see it. And it's a little hide and seek kind of game uh, with another animal that I've, I've put into the book. And it's something I've, I've, I've not publicly put out there. I'm, I'm just hinting at it now <clears throat> that if kids read the book more times over and over, there's another cute little mystery <clears throat> inside the book. It's almost like a hidden Easter egg, which I love those little things in movies yeah. or, you know, like the hidden Mickeys at, at uh, Disneyland. They have all right. these hidden Mickeys everywhere. So I have something in this book that's kind of <clears throat> unique and true to myself. Um, and it's not a magic trick. It's just something cute that I'm, I'm going to see if any who comes up with over the next few months and years when they start purchasing the book. Because it just came out about a week and a half ago. What age group would you say this book is for? Two to eight years old. You know, okay. that's the age group for, you know, and I say two, meaning it's something they can look at visually and the parents can read it to them during, you know, bedtime. And then as if we're guessing five and six and understand it, you know, that's something they could read on their own, you know, so. And about how many pages is it? It's 36 pages. Okay. And yeah, now when it came to publishing this, did you do this as a self-publication uh, online or did you go to a publishing house like random or something or? I made a, a deal with Amazon and Kindle and I went through a different, different publishing companies and looking at where their rates were at and the costs and the, the effectiveness of everything. And as you know, I'm all about overhead and, and getting a product out there that goes for my show here in Las Vegas, for my YouTube stuff, for my television work. And so cha nothing changes at a book level. So as I was looking at a, as I was looking at that book level, I was like, well, 
where can I go and get the best bang? And Amazon is just the best in the world. You know, and the reason I say that is because when you do deal with them, <clears throat> it instantly goes to every country in the world, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they have the marketing plan and the distribution and all that stuff. And it's it really a great system. And for people who don't know, you know, Amazon started as a book, book company, you know, now it's, of course it's our, you know, it's like our Costco in the air, you know, but um, but that's, that's who we're, we're, we signed a deal with and we're really happy with them. And so they publish this kind of on demand whenever someone Correct. asks print for it. Demand, so you know, like and that's the way stock, things, right? mm -hmm. yeah, print and demand is the way things are going now. You know what I mean? Unless you own a souvenir shop or you're have a theater, you know, or you're on tour, you know, like a Jimmy Buffett or any of us go on tour, you can get a certain amount. But nowadays with print and demand now, it's such an easier way to do things. You don't have to house the stuff. You don't have to warehouse things, you know, and, and with the way the printers and things are working nowadays, you can print it. So, you know, reasonably without having a warehouse of 10,000 books and the rental of the warehouse and everything else. Do you have a few of those in also you sell like back of the room sales. So after your show is mm -hmm. over, some people. Yeah. Our gift shop after the show outside, they come, they, we have, we sell those. And this is actually the number one seller now at my show um, over everything else we have. Cause I think it's something unique and not many people have it. You know what I mean? I didn't set out to be a writer. I'm not a writer or an author. It's not, I'm not one of these people that need to have 17 titles under my name. You know, I do things. Cause I, uh, I want to do things, you know, and I enjoy them. So when people call me an author or publisher, I, uh, I'm not very comfortable with that just yet because, well, you know, I think yeah. of big, you know, John Grisham as a real writer, you know, let's get serious for a second, you know, <laughs> or Dr. Seuss is a real writer who's iconic, you know, or JK right. Rowling, you know? So for me, putting a few words on a paper with a cool idea, it's very hard for me to accept. So what you're that. saying, I, it sounds like is there's not another book that you have planned as a sequel to this. Not really, but I, there, there is a couple others that are in the, that I've thought about it, you know, um, it, it's with like the, the nighttime type of thing, you know, um, we're all the same size, which, you know, when we're in space, we're all the same size. So I thought about doing a space book because people love kids love space sure. and looking down or and dinosaurs. Realistically, when you're in space, you are the same size because you're looking back at the earth and you realize, wow there really is not a lot of difference in us when you're that far away. We're pretty similar, you know? And I think if a lot of people could see that, we wouldn't be having wars in Ukraine and all these other problems we have across the world. But unfortunately, not many of us have had the chance to go up that far to look back down. Well, that's true. Uh, is this available then also digitally? Obviously, that you should have a hard copy of this so you can sit down in the bed with your child and they could look at it and and uh, and everything. But, uh, but the, since it is Amazon, I assume that they have a, chem a Kindle edition as well. Yeah, they have Kindle and we also got the paperback and we didn't go with a hard book cover, which is what I really wanted as well, because with Amazon to do a hard cover for Amazon, you're, you have to be around 76 pages for that. And but realistically, kids books uh, should be, you know, between 32 and 38 pages is kind of what what mm -hmm. kids books run mm -hmm. at. Um, so so that wasn't in that wheelhouse. But down the road, we may find a publishing company to do a hard cover book, you know, at the moment, right now with print on demand and hard covers are a different machine, you know, and they're not as cheap as well because a hard cover is a whole different printing process, you know. Right. Well, it sounds like since this has just been released, it's an excellent suggestion for the holiday season for people to uh, buy for their children. And also it's not something again, directed uh, for magic, uh, magic or magicians or teaching magic, actually nothing to do with magic whatsoever, other than I guess the, the magic of, uh, of uh, uh, relating to uh, each other. Yeah. Yeah. And that shocked a lot of people. I, I don't know. How'd you not make the guy a little wizard and all that? So, well, that's why I kind of like it. You know, I do things in life that, that, that I, you know, I like not being always attached to magic, even though indirectly it is, you know, for my landscaping company, you know, that my wife and I have to this book, you know, I, I do want to do other things that, that aren't that, you know, yes, the, the kid in there looks like me, but but don't forget, I'm, I mimic myself off of Phyllis Diller and uh, Richie Rich you know, and all these other little comic book characters and stuff like that, Fido Dito, you know, and all these people. So, so my look isn't my look. I stole that from somebody else, you know? So, so therefore this little kid does look like me, but then again, I'm trying to look like somebody else. <laughs> so well, that yes. sounds great. One last thing then again, for people to, where they can get that is going to be at amazon.com. Yeah, Amazon.com. And if you're in Australia, it's Amazon Australia. If you're in Canada, it's Amazon Canada. Uh, if you're in Japan, it's Amazon Japan, you know, so that's the way it works with them. But have it's at nighttime. We're all the same size. And then if you put my name in Murray Sawchuk, uh, it'll come up. So it'll probably come up quicker under my name, uh, Murray Sawchuk, than at nighttime. We're all the same size just because uh, it's the first thing I've actually published and I'm selling on Amazon. There hasn't been any interest so far, I guess, to date, as far as this being published in other languages. 
Uh, not yet. No, I've, we do have it um, for Kindle and stuff like that, but it's still sold in Japan and uh, in, you know, other places like that, but it's in the English version. It's not, it's not changed. But, right. but my other thing, like you said, just as a note too, I have thought about, cause you know me, I absolutely love Christmas. So I've thought about doing this in a Christmas book. Cause I love Christmas books. You know, there's one you have around the house. So basically it's the same book almost um but it's you know christmas we're all the same size or it's the same book with with all the artwork done you know with a christmas flair so that's great well murray congratulations on uh, this project and i wish you nothing but the best of luck with this uh going forward and uh, not only into this holiday season but into the future then as well yeah thank you so much uh, scott i appreciate it <laughs> uh, miss senior and you're always a guest here you know that thank you looking forward to coming to see your new home uh, I can't wait. <laughs> and so that was the author of At Nighttime, We're All the Same Size. That was Murray Sawchuck. And this is Scotty Out. So there you have it, boys and girls, some perfect gift selections for this holiday season. So again, if you're looking for something to buy for your child or your grandchild, this is a good book to buy for them and to sit down and read with them. And by the way, here's a lovely little gift that Amy Kimlet is offering to all of the Magic Word listeners. Specifically, if you go to amykimlet.com slash magic word, and that's all lower le lowercase letters, magic word, there you can find a special link where you can actually download a free digital copy of her book, Hocus Pocus, Practice Focus. Her intent is hopefully that it will, by doing this, it will encourage you then to leave a nice review on Amazon. She needs a lot of reviews in order to help uh, promote and sell the book. And also after you've seen a digital copy of this, perhaps that you might want to purchase your own hard copy of this book then as well uh, while you're there. But again, a free copy available for Magic Word listeners at amykimlat.com slash magic word. And again, I encourage you please to leave a uh, five-star comments for her and Amazon to help boost her rating so that she can help uh, sell this uh, new release book of hers. It's very good. I think you'll enjoy it. And I also, again, encourage you to buy your own hard copy of this book for your children for this Christmas. You will enjoy Hocus Pocus, Practice Focus, and also at nighttime, we're all the same size. And again, for grandparents, or older people, you don't have to be a grandparent, <laughs> I would recommend then Grandpa Magic by Alan Kronzik. All three good reads. I think you will enjoy them. And again, please use amazon.com link that's on the magic word podcast.com. And there you'll be able to help support us as well as having an enjoyable gift for your child or grandchild. And so from the North Pole, stay well, get booked, and don't be naughty. <laughs> this is Santa out.